and Lawrence Everhart, who's been here for the last two weeks making new work. Um, some of which we may see in Lismore soon. <laughs> so, um, no pressure on Lawrence. <laughs> but, um, Lawrence has been here for the last couple of weeks to make, make some work, and we have an exhibition of Lawrence's work, the solo show that we're developing, to be with us in uh, July, I think. And, um, and Darren Knight, Lawrence's uh, dealer, is here today, and he's been a great support and help with that exhibition as well. So, thanks, Darren. Um, so, Lawrence is here in Australia as a result of the Museum of Contemporary Arts exhibition. Which, to me, is just uh, one of the fine uh, American photographers and style photography. But Lawrence sort of works in black and white. Glenn's going to talk to Lawrence a bit more about his practice, his work, and to, um, to talk about how he makes his images as well. And, and I think it's, for me, as a background in photography who sort of learnt in that traditional analog way I, I do struggle in the digital age and to me photography is all about white and silver and the reaction of light on film so I think it would be great to sort of hear Lawrence talk a little bit more about that so welcome and thanks everyone. We might talk about the exhibition a little bit too along the way which is trying to talk about an exhibition where we're not where we're not at the exhibition and the funny thing about it too is that I think Lawrence's work in particular demands one person looking at them maybe at one time, then it's something that's a singular sort of experience. Uh, just to begin with too, can I thank Linnaeus and also thank Brett, and thank you to Julia and Andrew in particular, it's great to be here. Um, it's great too that Lawrence is here and Greta is here also, and Darren and Susie, so it's good to have everybody here. It's very relaxing, I can tell you. I can't believe we're just staying here for two days, so um, thank you to everybody been very welcome. Um, I would like Lawrence to speak, so I might set him off somehow, because we have it here, his camera, and I think in terms of technique and medium, that is really sort of an integral part to the art that Lawrence makes. So maybe Lawrence, if you could talk a little bit about your camera, and then we can go from there, because it's sort of like an elephant in the room. He's <laughs> called an invisible camera too, isn't it? A camera that's ma made by the Seabold Invisible Camera Corporation, which is a sense of humour that went out of fashion around about 1900. <laughs> <laughs> the camera is older than that. Um, people make a big play on that. Um, to me, it's somewhat irrelevant in that um, I had, a long time ago, I um, Sort of started the 70s, I was determined to be a photographer and I had aspirations of being a, not a complete but somewhat sort of alternative lifestyle and it seemed to me that if I could acquire this sort of camera um, it would remove a piece of equipment in the middle, namely an enlarger because the camera takes a negative this size and, and that is of sufficient size to read quite well and you can make a contact point which is essentially you have the negative that the camera produces, you put it on a piece of photographic paper, put a piece of glass on it to keep it flat, switch a light bulb on, expose the paper and it's that simple. And it seemed to me that I would be better trying to keep it simple than sophisticated. And around about the same time, I was um, being youthful and full of enthusiasm, was introduced to um, a range of photographers, mainly commercial people. And somewhere in that process, I saw this thing happen where I recognized in their witnessing my enthusiasm that they had lost something, that somehow become a slave to acquiring equipment. Sort of commercial photographer's downfall that I'll take on this job, but I need this lens. So you end up becoming a slave to having a vast photographic arsenal. And I resolved not to go that way. And um, so it took me a number of years to acquire the camera because these things weren't in New Zealand, and when I did, which is in 74, um, it was 
synchronous with the, um, what became known as the second oil crisis. And for the first time, we started to understand a concept called finite resources. Because uh, we understood that oil was going, and suddenly silver was vanishing out of the world at the same time. And, and people thought, oh, well, silver's the next finite resource. They didn't know there were two mad Texas billionaires called the Hunt Brothers that were single-handedly trying to acquire the entire world's supply of silver so they could release it back onto the market and take the prices. So when I bought that, that was just happening. And um, everybody said, ah, that's all over. It's going to be dyes and chemicals now. Forget the silver. And I made a small, small quiet, solemn promise to myself that I would use it for as long as it was possible to use it. And I'm still doing that, but suddenly and quite ridiculously, it is becoming unbelievably difficult post-digital. Digital, some of you may be aware, has caused the demise of every photographic, major photographic country, company in the world. Kodak's gone down the tube, Agfa went down the tube, Ulfid's still is still in some form of bankruptcy, but understand that there is a need for materials that are still running. So suddenly all the things that I have taken granted for almost 40 years by this sort of developer, you turn around and get it, and it's no longer there. So I'm forced at the moment essentially to do things like make up my own developers. And it's making the part of it that um, I've always taken for granted. I've never wanted to be an esoteric uh, photographer because I think it's a democratic medium and even though my prices are, of my work are in the hands of the art market, I still believe that um, I try and produce something that would be a work of a work that's available to anybody if they so desire it. It's not, it's not excessively expensive. And um, one of the easy ways to make something expensive is to limit it by doing handcrafted processing and limited production. For me, they're all ways of just extracting more money out of it. And um, I don't quite buy into it. So, I'll just briefly explain the camera because um, it's, it seems to be of interest to some people. Um, as, I, as, I, as I said, this is the size of the, of the negative. You carry your film around in holders. There's a, there's a, and there is an unexposed sheet of film. This is a slide which I won't cut out because there's a sheet of film in there. So you set the camera up. It has, this is a crude one, and I like it because it's crude. It's not, it's, it's fast, I can use it fast. It's light. It's a bit vulnerable, and I dropped it the other day. And, it's, um, and Lawrence, you once said you wanted a camera that a car can do. Yeah, and it's going to have to go back to the car. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yeah. it's, it's very simple. It's, you'll see it. It's just two pieces of wood. The ability in the middle to focus it by... That's, that's all, all that's doing is changing the focal length of the box just a simple Constantina yellows. All your, all your controls that are in your lens, so your shutter speeds, all that in there, and your f-stop. So the, the lens is the expensive part of the camera. The lenses are modern because there have been refinements in the uh, lens technology, which would be stupid to ignore. Um, it's really, it's just 
a simple box, and I keep it that way, and I keep it pretty simple in terms of how I approach things. I have, how oh, should I put it? I'm interested in the stuff that the world doesn't notice, really, I think, would be one way of putting it, really. Yeah, that would be a good one. Yeah. In that, what interests me are things that most people will walk by. And to me, my, one of my functions is to try and discern what the world might notice, but later on regret not having recorded it. So I'm more interested in the ordinary and the humdrum, and that produces often, of course you realise the other part of it is this ridiculous and not this one. <laughs> and that's, that's just increasing the dark for an aspect so you can actually see what's going on in the, on the ground lines. But this this aspect of, of photograph on that has got some sort of relationship to an ostrich with its head in the sense. <laughs> A very common experience for me is to be under there and the camera pointing at something and I hear a background commentary and people find it really offensive. They are quite disturbed that such an important looking camera is actually focused on what they would regard as a piece of rubbish and I hear background commentary like, oh, that's disgusting, look at them, oh. <laughs> and um, the other, other aspect, which is fairly unique to New Zealand, is um, if you're photographing on the side of the road, a beer bottle will be thrown at you by a passing car. <laughs> never, never when I'm out in it, only when I'm under. But, um, and unfortunately, people have asked me, Did I, uh, is there any work here of mine um, to look at? But I'm here to take photographs, and I've learned a long time ago, it's not a good thing to confuse the two. That's what I do, I bring the camera. If I was here to do something else, I wouldn't have brought the camera, I'd be doing that. Mm. And how have you found it around here? You are working on a big project. Uh, at the moment, I, I have always photographed. Um, Maybe, sorry, I might just pass this around. Yeah. I tend to, not absolutely, but um, many years ago when you were learning photography and looking at photographs and photographers were, I used to see work from such and such photographers and this, such and such a series and I would go, oh, why, why would you follow, why would you do a series of work? Why would you just go looking for one thing? And I started to notice aspects of small town architecture in New Zealand that were vanishing. The first thing I noticed were sonic lodges, which almost every small New Zealand town had one once, and actually not a big feature in small town Australians. There are some, but they're yeah, not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are some. Yeah. Uh, in, in New Zealand, it well, was pretty much universal. And they were the first things that started to go. And I realised this, so I started specifically photographing Masonic Lodges and then our government decided to get rid of post offices and banks decided to shut up small towns. So these are all things that you gradually start adding to your um, catalogue of subject matter. And what I discovered is that there's a, a wonderful aspect of looking for something and in that process of looking for the one thing you end up discovering a whole range of other things by trying to find the lodge in town or something like that. Uh, one of the things that I've always photographed are war memorials um, and particularly and certainly this trip this time realising that in a couple of years time, a year and a half time, it will be um, the anniversary of the centenary of the First World War and of 
more particularly for both our countries of Gallipoli. And I realised a couple of years ago that what would probably happen about three months out from one of those dates, some bright New Zealand art gallery would suddenly have the idea that it would be great to get me to do an exhibition on them. So <laughs> I thought I'd actually be well ahead of that. <laughs> and I have photographed in Australia as much as I've been able to since 1997. Um, and I have photographed war memorials, but this time I have been particularly concentrating on them. So uh, that's what I've been doing up here. And how have you, I mean, to me, you were perhaps one of the great sort of chroniclers of New Zealand, but you have travelled quite a lot. And you said you had a, some interesting feedback about the Anzac, that ANZ part of it. Oh, that, that was, I still find this very disconcerting, and I shouldn't actually say it publicly, but I will, <laughs> <laughs> which is that. Uh, various people, various organisations in New Zealand got to hear of what I was doing and were very keen. The Rotary was very keen, the Rotary, the Rotary and, and and as soon as I outlined what I thought my project should cover, which is it was important for me to honour the A part of the Anzac, the Australian part, the New Zealand side just backed off, which was disconcerting to me, but equally, um, New Zealand's very, very insolent. To my great um, delight, I realised a number of years ago, once I had my very good dealer, um, that I was selling New Zealand images because that's all I'd taken essentially to Australians that weren't. New Zealanders in Australia, but they were New Zealand, they were Australians. Um, then I've been photographing Australia since 97, and I've sold two Australian photographs to New Zealand. And that's, I find, disturbing. <laughs> I understand it, but it's still disturbing. I think we might open it up if people do have questions because yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lawrence, uh, you said you've been driving around the area uh, when you are, have your mind on a particular topic or theme is your mind open to other things do you then sort of able to see a particular thing that you want to uh, take a photograph of that's different, that's outside the realm. Are you multi, I guess, do you have a wide uh, oh, lens, yes, if you yes, like, yes, on yeah. opportunities? No, I'm, I'm always open to anything. Really. So like, what kinds of things have you been taking photos of in this visit? Well, war memorials in particular. Um, I'm, I did the obligatory trip to recently you'll notice it's got rather than a large number of potholes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and um, the very conscientious uh, road has it identifiers have gone along and the blue road and then some other assumed locals have come along and turned the pothole into a strange fish shape. Mm -hmm. And one of the images I am looking forward to very much is a crack across the road which was identified and has been morphed into a nimbin snake. <laughs> so it's um, things like that really, you know. Um, one, of the, one of the other things I, I'm always interested in is trying to get inside places, but I'm a reticent person myself, so in some cases that's difficult, but um, small country halls, things like that, are always very interesting for me. I love particularly a wonderful aspect of ordinary Australian architecture, which is 
the house where I go, but why do you even bother putting windows in the ceiling? You've just shut everything out. I mean, there are houses, the further you get into the outback, where um, there's no way that the people inside could ever look out because the shuttering is so extensive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something you just don't see in these I mean, It's always taken me I'm um, particularly interested in. Um, a lot of places that you photograph when you've gone back to find it, it's gone. Gone. Off. And that's, that's one of the other things. I'm, I'm always trying to um, look at things that are vulnerable, things that you might, probably won't ever get identified as important. And, um, and somebody should, as I said, somebody should notice them. And um, I'm particular in that. One of the things I learned teaching myself photography a long time ago is if the light ain't right, it's not worth doing. So um, often you'll see something that really takes my fancy, but the light isn't good, so you, you have to come back. And as in Australia, it's often not the next day, it might be four or five years later, and often it's gone. So, yeah. Because the thing is, sorry, as the book goes around, you said there's quite a lot of photographs you've taken in centuries where that thing has happened, where you've taken photographs and you've gone back and it's been vandalized. I, I, I do do specific things. If I go to an area, one of the things I usually try and do is find the cemetery because the cemetery of a place is a very good read out of the historical character of, of the place so you can see how rich it is what sort of the cultural background you know often it's scottish or i've tracked a um a sort of pattern of german lutheranism from south australia as it comes across victoria uh, and you can do this by just visiting cemeteries um, and some years ago, when I was back in the bottom part of the South Island of New Zealand, the first time in 20 years, um, I did a revisit of old haunts that I knew very well. And uh, a wave of vandalism had gone through the South Island. So I went to cemeteries and just found all these beautiful old monuments that I never bothered photographing, because you take them granted that they're stone, they're marble, they're always going to be there. They've been just trashed and vandalized. So um, increasingly, but you just go, oh, well, I just have to start doing that. Um, so I'm always trying to get, uh, it's, the difficulty is trying, not just taking on a subject, but trying to make an image out of it as in it has to make sense so I, I try and put it in some sort of landscape context I suppose I mean. yeah. so you um, it's not just a recording of a thing it's trying within it trying to make some sort of I just want to make a, a proper photograph out of it I suppose, in another sense, in a civic state. I think we have a question here first, and then we'll... Oh, I was just, it's probably a question for you as well as Lawrence. I, mean, um, I was just wondering if you could tell us about how you put Lawrence together with me and Noah for the show. OK, so the show is called South of No North. And just to explain the title a little, a little bit, South is William Edelston, is an American photographer who lives and works in Memphis, southern part of the US. Lawrence, of course, comes from north, the north part of New Zealand, north in Brussels, so the south of no north is one connection. And it's also the title of a book of short stories by the American writer Charles Bukowski, because I think as you look at the images and as you look at all three artists' work, all three artists' work work in a way that I think each image is almost like a short story. So it's almost seems like a collection of short stories in the exhibition. 
We've been doing the MCA a series of shows where we ask an Australian artist, in this case Noel McKenna, who's prim primarily known as a painter, to exhibit alongside an international artist to sort of put their work into an international context. And Noel sort of broke those rules in that he chose two artists to exhibit alongside. So Lawrence is the international artist and William Eggleston. Um, Noel, I think, is it's funny because people, when you'd say, oh, it's Noel, and then you'd say it's these two photographers, Noel is known as a painter, and people would say that. Why, why is Noel chosen two photographers? But I think Noel, a lot of Noel's work comes from photography. He takes photos himself, and he looks at a lot of photography. And when you actually see the show, look, I hope people do get a chance to go up, and I'll just put in a point, I do have some copies of the book for sale. You know, Lawrence will probably, will probably sign while he's here. Um, once you put it up on the wall, it all seems to me to make perfect sense. It's all, everything is linked sort of quite beautifully. So that's how I do it. Yeah, that's Noel's doing. So people say they don't like it, I say it's Noel. It's me, I One of the things also, Glenn was conscious that uh, 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 the four exhibition was on, and that's so essentially big. Mm -hmm. And this. Our show is essentially small. Yeah, there's nothing over the biggest painting, which is a work of Knowles, is 97 centimetres by 97, which is small. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, uh, if, if some of you know photography, you will know the work of a great American photographer called Walter Evans, whom I've always taken a great deal of um, inspiration from. A few years ago, I read a review, um, someone whom I have since met um, had access to Walker Evans' as negatives and he made very beautiful digital scanning negatives, digital prints of them, but they were enlarged. And the criticism was not so much that they were digital, but the fact that they had been enlarged. And the writer, I can't shouldn't let you try and quote if you can't do it exactly, but he put it absolutely beautifully. He said, somehow the joy of this size of photograph and the fact that it's the contact print is it makes you want to get closer and your eyes are always satisfied no matter how close you get. Whereas, and as a photographer, I'm always even with paint or anything, I always want to look at it really closely to understand all this. And often I find that that's when a work doesn't hold up. You know, it's, if you, you put it under close scrutiny, often things fall apart a lot. A lot of things are made to only be stood back from. I'm interested in making uh, things that you're actually forced to look into. Lawrence, um, I know that very occasionally you have done portraits, but has there ever been a temptation to do more, or is it the limitation of your camera, or, or has it just never appeared? I think I heard you name it. Portraits, was it? Portraits, yes. yes. Um, um, one of the things is that generally I'm out on the road and um, People really aren't often interested in the 10 minutes, or so, well, it doesn't usually take 10 minutes, but let's say the five minutes of mucking around. To, to, they used to, oh, can I take a picture? Sure, snap, you know, that's it. That's what people are interested in. To do more than that, most people aren't interested. I've always uh, had the thought that I would love to be Sit, uh, based in a city for a while, and if I did, I'd either um, set the camera up on a street corner and do a lot of anonymous portraiture of just sort of essentially like this, people waiting for traffic lights or something and photographing. And, but equally, I'd love to have access to a proper, natural light, 19th century photographic studio where um, 
Uh, that's, the, that's the other thing I think I should explain about what I do. I'm a, a natural light photographer, albeit if it's an interior and it's very dark and they have electric lights, I'll turn the electric light on. But um, I, I'm not a flash filler because I think that blands things out. But if I had the right environment, I would love to do portraits. Um, again, I think what, would, what interests me are archetypes. I think I would be interested in photographing specific sorts of people, the people that always look, you know what I mean? And you see people and you go, oh, that, that's a person that looks like that person, that looks like that person, that looks like that person. I'd like to do that, but again, um, it's just... Um, do you find a lack of quality on close examination? Lack of, so I've been swearing my Of all the portrait people? Uh, no, 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 no I, um, They're all fine people, are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, people say I don't... I'm known for taking people with photographs, but equally, at any time, I could put on rather large exhibitions that involve photographs of people. Can I just grab the book? And maybe, Lawrence, you could talk a little bit about there is perhaps my favourite image of yours in the exhibition. Now I just have a private. Then I can pull it up. Which is this portrait of a family group. So it's not much bigger. It'd probably be that big, wouldn't it? Really, in reality. It is, yeah. Yes. yeah. So that image, which the background to that tells a lot about your portraits of people. The, the background about that was that um, I was wandering in Auckland in '93, I think. I was uh, starting a big process of uh, demolishing environments, building high-rise flats. Uh, I wandered into a lumberyard, a timber yard that was being demolished, and I found the environment that that photograph was taken in. It was a long uh, wood curing kiln. So the walls, the concrete, had all been baked and baked and baked, and there was a fantastic textural aspect to them. But equally, down the end of it, which was a long, long space, there was an area that you just felt warm and comfortable. It was quite an odd experience, and I stood there and went, this feels nice, just it had a warmth about it. And um, so I, I said, this is the sort of environment I'd love to take photographs of people in. It's a sort of ready-made studio. Uh, next morning I went down the corner, I went back there and I went down the corner to a photo photographer friend and asked him if I could take his photograph in, in this environment. I said, I found a place that I just love to use as a, a studio. And I set the camera up, taking this photograph, so it was essentially, it was a bit further back from the wall, but it was like that. And, and at the, at, way at the end of the kiln, a head stuck its head around the corner and said, do you take photographs of people? And I looked at them and I said, step this way. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of the workers demolishing the, the lumber yard, and um, his partner and his little boy had come to have morning tea with him. And they just walked into the photograph, and I, I didn't pose them, they just walked in front of the camera, and the, the man was holding his boy like this, and I said, don't move. And I just went, click, and I went, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move. Don't move, don't move, don't move, don't move. And then the boy started moving and I went clap and I worked out. It was probably about 18 seconds. And what amazed me is if you look at the photograph, the boy is standing on his father's hands and he's pretty much rock solid on, on the camera. And I turned around to hurry the photographer friend and I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And Jim since asked me, did the people get the photograph? And I said, yes. And they were disappointed it wasn't the colour. <laughs> <laughs> and when you do see that photograph, I mean, the thing that really, I think, makes it is the mother looking back at the child. Yeah. It's a terrific image. It, really it, terrific. it 
but as I said, it was unpublished. It just happened that way. But um, a more deliberate person would propose that this the whole Trinity would be, I think, or an allegory. Mm. More questions? I'm interested in the amount of time that it takes. You were saying about it takes longer than just a digital camera. So if you were going back to Newman a long ago and you saw the rainbow circuit and decided to take a photograph of it, how long would it take you to get the equipment out of the car, set up, and I presume you only take one shot because of the cost? So what essentially the cost keep, makes you keep it down for um, If it's really exceptional and it has a lot of huge amount of sky in the photograph, and I think it's great, I may take two because uh, one of the problems of this is you're um, on the road, you're always having, thank you, Marianne, it's quite a perfect environment, you're always trying to find a dark place to change film because you only can carry a limited amount of film, so you're swapping film over and if you can't control the environment, sometimes you'll get little bits of dust that will fall on your negative, and dust on your negative produces black on the photograph. So little black spots or hairs in the sky are a nuisance. So but it's super important. I'll take two. And with a bit of sky, but generally I try and take one um, because, well, that's another, I could diverge to that in a minute. But um, the other aspect that I do like is um, if, you, if any of you are photographers, the normal lens for this camera is a 300 millimeter, but that is the equivalent of 50 millimeter on a 35 mil camera. But 300 millimeter lens still has the same depth of field issues that a 300 millimeter lens on a 35 mil camera has, which is if you're using it wide open, the depth of field, the amount that you're focused on that's in focus in front and behind that focal point is very shallow. It's, it's typical, you'll see it in a telephoto, what you would call a telephoto lens, where foreground's out of focus, the subject's in focus, the background's out of focus. I like sharp pictures. Uh, it's necessary to make a small f-stop or aperture stop in the lens to bring the depth of field in to increase the focal length. Um, so generally, outside at the moment, bright sunlight, the about a second exposure at f64. But once you're away from bright sunlight, it can be anything. Um, and I like that aspect of it. Um, it's one of the things that a photograph will do that other mediums can't do. It does what photographs do. And photographs have a relationship to reality and time in the way that a long exposure of out there is going to bring aspects of time into it and the, the clouds move, foliage moves. Um, so I like to incorporate that into the photograph as much as is practical, I think. The other great problem with a camera this size is people go, oh, it's a beautiful day, but it's blowing about 15 knots to forget it, you know, because the camera is going to shake. So wind is, a, is an awful annoying aspect of things as well. So <coughs> I'm interested, again, to um, use as long as possible exposure time, mainly just to bring those aspects that only a photograph can do that other mediums can't. But I still photograph them. And how long does it take that just physically set up? I can do it. I can probably get it up and going if it's if you see something you have to photograph and you can see that light's going really fast, I can probably take it in about 30 seconds. The worst though is seeing the absolute simple square building that's dead simple in the middle of nothing and everything's easy to take and it can take 20 minutes of just muck 
in the land. <laughs> I don't know, it's sort of inverse law of things. If you, if you have to do it fast, you do it fast, and um, it can take an absurdly long time. And some of your images of the Tarot Map can be used on the now or on the Interiors, I, I did a long time ago a whole series of uh, where I live in Northland. It's um, the first point of contact of Europeans and Maori. So um, what the local old architecture are, are a whole range of small wooden Maori churches, which are all essentially, the best ones are all built in the 1900s. They've still got the original varnish in them. No electric lights, so they're very, very dark. And some of those are an hour, an hour and a half, two hour exposures, just to get a certain amount of depth of field and the lack of light. Um, the, a very well known photograph that I, I've taken in New Zealand is of, of say, Mount Taranaki. Um, I, I prefer to just call it Taranaki. It's a volcan volcano in the province of Taranaki and it dominates the province. And um, some years ago, when my son was still at school, I said, let's go down um, to Taranaki. Uh, you can have a snow experience and I can always get a photograph. We were there for five days and the mountain sucks in the weather. So even though we were staying about a kilometre from the base of it, the five days we were there, it was completely shut off with a wall of grey cloud. So I didn't see it at all. And on the last night we were there, I went around to pick up my friend's daughter further around the side of the mountain, coming back at about 10 o'clock at night. And the clouds rolled away, it was pretty much full moon. I said, this is the only opportunity I'm going to have to take the photograph. I've never done this before. I um, pushed the camera into a hedge, <laughs> got back to where I was standing, pushed the camera because it was buffeted a bit. Um, worked out a possible if stop. So I had no idea how long this is going to take, but I'll just go and sleep on the couch. I always wake up at some time during the night. I woke up five or six hours later and stepped outside. You couldn't see the mountain again, it just shut down the cloud. It didn't work with it. I got back to the dark room and because each negative takes about half an hour of processing and you know, by the time you finish with it, it takes 20 minutes or so, half an hour. It was like, that one's no good. Can I be bothered? Oh, let's, let's, let's just do it. And it's my single, one and only, all time, Best <laughs> 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 it's just it's a lovely image of um, the mountain with um, again with a, cl a, a cloud a cloud cap moving around it bit by moonlight. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I guess I was just thinking then if you like sharp birds, it sounds like you can see that healthy relationship. Yes, but it's, it's, it's sharp and sure. yeah, at the same time. Yeah. 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 Always. Always. No, no, um, I'm always open to suggestions. Please see me afterwards. Can you give us a hint of the photos we're going to see in July? Is there a particular theme for those? No, um, in that um, originally the show that's in the MCA was, we were hoping was going to go to um, Art Gallery and Lismore, but um, because of a well justified um, concern that the National Art Gallery has the, um, over that William Eggleston colour photographs, because I think. If 
may deteriorate. I don't think they will be able to be made again, will they? No. No. Unless they do it fast. Yeah. Because, um, again, the Eggleston photographs are a form of colour technology that's, I think, I heard you say there's one. There's one guy in America. One guy in America that's still possibly able to print that way. But, um, so they've gone, so they, they can't go to this more, but um, so therefore we have had to rethink what the show will be, and really it will be, um, because I keep on supplying photographs for the exhibition and they never sell, Darren was a very healthy stock, and, um, and put together I think three of us or two of us or however many of us will work out something that will have a bit of everything probably. Because um, not there'll be something from here this time, but equally um, I'm, I've been in the past extremely enamored with it switch. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's quite an amount of lip switch still around, I think. Yeah, there are, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Could I just ask why it couldn't go to this more? Is it because the gallery doesn't have the sufficient uh, environment? It is, it's just climatic control. And that's one of the. I, I, I suffer from this because. Because my photographs are small and they're black and white and they require you to have to look into them. And that essentially my photographs, the bane of my life is seeing them in professional curated spaces where they go, oh, we can't have it above X number of lux levels. And you know, I'm going, look, and my photographs turn it up and let people see. So it's, it's Essentially that. Uh, and why I ask that is, as you are aware, and everybody in the room at Lismore would love to have a suitable gallery, mm -hmm. and we're, most of us here are working towards that. Good. So this is, will just add to our arguments. Mm -hmm. Do you, well, okay, you Brent, do you want me to say something? <laughs> oh, we would have loved for the show to go to Lismore, and we tried really hard. Mm -hmm. The National Gallery has incredibly strict standards in terms of climate control. Appropriate. And that taking Eggleston out of the show, I think, would have changed the show. You couldn't do the show without Eggleston. So it is a shame it's not coming with that. It's the reason. And the National Gallery, rightfully so, have those restrictions. Yeah, yeah. But this is so, just add to our argument. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think it's a really great argument, too, that you can take. Because, I mean, it'd be great for things. The National Gallery has an amazing collection. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great to show some of that thing. It should be distributed in the collection more. Mm -hmm. Evenly across the country, so that is really great. And that is the only reason because we would have done everything in 10 minutes. Yeah. 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 The same you are doing the um, war wars at the moment. Have you found over time, having done so many, that subconsciously you tend to you find that you're attracted to something particular in those photos when you take Because all of us just don't click and go, oh, yes, it's, you know. It's squared up on a giant bang. Yeah. But have you found over the series of so many years taking them that something subconsciously is connecting you all? Oh, well, what this, they do become very interesting because uh, one is you find that uh, there's a particular form of local, this time I'm concentrating on what you would call digger memorials, which mm -hmm. have soldier, mm -hmm. soldiers on it. Here I've already discovered there's a particular local aspect to that. Just as in South London, New Zealand, there's a really crude little concrete guy that's crouched like this. And so you, you see this variation that moves, like the ones in Sydney will be different to the ones here. And, and there's also this other thing of, um, because a lot of them have like, have been in small towns, and often the small town is not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So, particularly in New Zealand, I've, I've got, I have photographs of a very, very fine monument, essentially, with nothing around it, um, sticking out of a pile of blackberry bushes and nothing else. Whereas, so you read it as, obviously, once there was a town, so you're getting a whole 
um, socio-historical reading as well. So um, I, I usually try and keep a... Um, uh, one of the other things I've always done is this, the fact that a lot of the things I photograph are the things that people wouldn't ordinarily notice. I tend to essentially stick them right in the centre of the picture and build the edges around it, conscious of what, what, what is being taken in and how much, but essentially giving the viewer um, no excuse not to notice what I want them to look at. So again, it's, it's a sort of construct that often works better in repetition. Maybe that's time. So thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, I think we're. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to have a chance to talk to Lawrence personally if you're happy or Glenn. So we'll have a drink and a sandwich. Thank you for coming. Thanks, you. Thank you.